And so now it is my honor and pleasure to bring on panel number two, who will have a discussion on unconscious bias moderated by Muriel Watkins. So Muriel, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Great. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. Uh, so, good day, everyone. Uh, delighted to be here. Uh, welcome to Using Your Power for Good. Uh, we're going to talk about rethinking privilege and creating access. My name is, uh, as has been said, is Muriel Watkins, uh, MRW Consulting Group International, and I'm excited to have the privilege of kicking off this panel. Uh, thank you all for being with us. Before we jump into the panel, we have a few housekeeping items. We are going to ask our panelists to do very brief introductions, but their complete bios are found on the speaker section of the event webpage. We will set aside time for questions at the end of the discussion. So if you have a question, please, by all means, send it to us through the question chat feature, and we'll try to get to as many of the questions as we can. We are recording the session, so if anything happens with your technology, no worries. We can get you a recording once the session wraps. And now, it is my pleasure to introduce our panel. So as I call your names, just take 30 seconds, give us the short version uh, uh, introduction of, of who you are. Uh, I'll start with Robin, Robin Geigel. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for inviting me. It's, it's an honor to be here. Um, I am Robin Geigel. I am an attorney. I am a partner at Gluck Walrath in Freehold, New Jersey. Uh, I practice primarily commercial and employment litigation. In addition to being an attorney, I am also an activist with a small a. I say small a because there's so many people who do so much more than I do. And I am a published author. I have two novels, uh, one that was published in 2021 and the other that was published this year, both reviewed in the New York Times. And um, I think I'm probably here because I am a transgender woman. So I can bring a, a different point of view to a lot of things. So thank you. Great. Thank you, Robin. Uh, Brittany Hale. Hi, good morning, everyone, and thank you for having us. So my name is Brittany Hale. I'm CEO and founder of B&D Consulting Group, where we bring humanist organizational design. After a very full career as an attorney, I pivoted toward helping organizations before they made the bad decisions. And so we work to operationalize uh, all of those aspirational values like diversity, like integrity, uh, so that organizations can save money, keep their best talent and develop effective leaders. I also uh, developed the, the um, brand for the first municipal social justice commission in New Jersey, in Rahway, New Jersey. So very excited about that and happy to speak with you all about unconscious bias. Thank you. And Michael Tizzoli. Good morning, everyone. My name is Michael Tizzoli, and I am not an attorney, so I will be the, the alternate of the, uh, of the crew here. Um, I am actually a clinician. I'm a, a psychotherapist, a licensed clinical social worker. I'm the CEO at West Bergen Mental Health Care. We are a community mental health center located up in Bergen County. We have almost 300 staff with um, more than 25 programs, and we'll see more than 4,000 clients this year. Um, I come to the table, I believe, um, because of my clinical background, certainly as the CEO, I have a leadership capacity and a business background, um, but I also look very much through the lens of uh, being a proud and out and open member of the LGBTQA plus community, um, where I not only participate that in my own world, but also in terms of my clinical work, um, focus almost exclusively or primarily on that, on that area. So, and I'm really, really happy to be here this morning. Wonderful. Thank you to the three of you. Uh, this, is, this is going to be a wonderful discussion. So let's get started. And let's start with the, you know, we, we talked about the focus of this being really on rethinking privilege. And so let's start with understanding what privilege is. What does privilege mean? And how have you seen privilege in your life? Would like to start. I'll I'll jump in if you want. Um, Go ahead, I think, Michael. Um, I think as a 
um, cisgender, Caucasian male. I experience it every single day, every restaurant I go to, every place I go. Um, I think that I um, am listened to in a different way. I'm heard in a different way. Um, and I just have a different experience. I also have the ability, um, as a member of the LGBTQA community, I very much have the ability to decide when I'm going to share that and how I'm going to share that and what that feels like. Um, and so that um, I also believe is, is very much part of um, an area that I, that I benefit from without question. Right, so Thank I'll you. just jump in, uh, you know, privilege as I like to define it, is a benefit that we haven't necessarily needed to do anything to receive, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so mm -hmm. that can be, and you know, Michael spoke to that. For myself, you know, being a, a black woman uh, and being an attorney, there are only about 2% of uh, attorneys within the United States that are uh, black women, right? So we are a, a rare breed, but uh, a great one. I also happen to be bilingual, right? So I see my uh, being bilingual as a privilege. One, I'm able to, uh, I have been able to connect with clients who um, were experiencing a gap, but it also allowed me to connect with communities within workspaces that traditionally were ignored. Right. And and sort of saw that um, being ignored, right, as a, a freedom for them to converse about what's going on in spaces where other people had no idea. So coming into organization, it's been a privilege to be bilingual and to connect with certain teams that may be used to being ignored or invalidated to really kind of get the inside scoop on uh, what's happening with uh, their teams truly. Right. Thank you, Brittany. Robin. So I think I bring a unique perspective to privilege um, in that I am the only one on the panel that has had the benefit of having heterosexual white male privilege mm. through a large portion of my life. Um, I, I didn't put in when I gave my brief biography that I've been practicing law for 45 years. Um, I suspect I'm by far the oldest person on the panel. Um, and um, so I grew up in a very different time and place and I didn't transition until I was in my fifties. So I had the benefit growing up of having, and I love the way Brittany defined that it, it's privilege. When we talk about privilege in this, in this space, we're talking about something that you don't even know you have. Um, it, it's an unknown. And, and, I will say from personal experience that I didn't realize that I was the beneficiary of heterosexual white male privilege as I was growing up because it's not something that you think about. You're not aware of it. Looking back, I can see how different the, the course of my life may, you know, might have been had I been born as a cisgender female. Um, and I say that with some you know, some knowledge because I have two older sisters and I know my oldest sister is much smarter than I am. And I don't say that in a self-deprecating way. I say it in an honest way. And when it was her turn to go to college, which would have been in the sixties, my dad, who was a very good man was like, women don't go away to college. You can go to the local college. When it came my turn to go to college in 1970, my dad would have sent me anywhere that wanted me. Um, I could go away. And so that's an example of privilege that I didn't realize I had at the time. And when I look back at the careers of the women that I went to law school with, I understand how much more or, or how much harder they had to work to earn their status than I did. Nobody handed me anything, but there were no barriers put in my way. No one asked me at a job interview when, you know, my wife wa was pregnant with our second child and we had an 18 month old, you know, how are you going to handle all of the, the family obligations that you have? Because I was being perceived as a male at that point in time. And they didn't perceive that I had those obligations. Whereas the women of my generation, those questions were asked them all the time. The last thing I'd like to end with in terms of my personal privilege, and I think you can extrapolate it out, is that once you're the beneficiary of it, 
even though I lost it when I transitioned in a certain respect, I didn't lose everything that I got from it because I still have the education. I still have my career. I still have my family. I still have things that I probably, you know, were the result of that privilege that I had. And even though I transitioned and I'm no longer, no longer perceived and I, and I never was that heterosexual cisgender white male, but now I'm not even perceived that way, that I didn't lose that. And so when we look at privilege broader, we not only have to look at what's the benefits that somebody has, but what are, what, you know, what do people lose that they can never get back who didn't have that privilege? So there are a few things that you've, you've all said, and thank you so much uh, for really starting this off with a, a clear view of privilege and, and what we're talking about. You talk about the benefits you don't know you have. Uh, you talked about not being aware. Um, you don't have to think about it. Uh, you don't have those barriers uh, that others may have. And you're, you all are uh, reflective, right? You're, you're all very much aware of these privileges that you have. And so if we think about for the participants um, in this session, how, how can participants reflect on their privilege? How can, how can we build that awareness um, when maybe we haven't had to think about it and, you know, and, and haven't developed that, that awareness of our privilege. What, what, are, what are your thoughts and, and kind of guidance to participants in this session about reflecting on their privilege? So I'll jump in. Uh, when I work with clients, before we do any assessments, any trainings, we always have a conversation about mindset. And the first thing that I say to people is, it's not about you and you need to have the courage to be curious. And it's, it's odd, right? How can I reflect on my privilege if it's not about me? But when we hear bias, and you know, a lot of people are off camera, but I can see people freeze up, fold their hands, right? We get in this defensive mode because we believe that uh, when we speak about bias, you know, that there's something to be defensive over, you know, and, and Robin spoke about all of the things that have been earned and people will reflexively want to say, well, I've, I've worked really hard. Right. So, so you can't talk to me about privilege and bias and, and all of these things, but that is what's happening. And that's the thing that we need to discuss. Right. So um, it's not about a personal character flaw. It's about how our brains operate. And that is the first thing that you need to understand when you reflect. If these feelings of defensiveness come through, that's an opportunity for you to get curious. Man, why do I feel defensive about that? You know, how do I, how do I engage with what I'm feeling? Can two things be true at the same time? Can I have worked really, really hard, but also understand that, as Robin stated, there were no impediments to me working hard because of how I look, sound, where I live, and the family I was born into. Great, thank you. I love that mindset and courage to be curious. Two things come to my mind around how we can help others, right? The, the question of, of how we can bring um, awareness to others. And um, two concepts come to my mind right away. First is empathy, right? Empathy, the in my mind, the key to life, by the way, <laughs> in my mind, is really empathy, both from a macro point of view in terms of the world and also micro, how we relate to each other, what what we and, and how we interact with each other. And so starting to ask folks around you some open-ended questions. What was that like for you? Question mark. And then here's the key. Shh, like, listen. What was that like for you? Help me understand that. Some of those questions that kind of dangly and open some space in between us, which allows you to kind of fill in your experience and for me to really listen and absorb. Um, and, and really the second concept, and this is the harder one, is tolerating discomfort, being uncomfortable right? Sitting with that, that's really hard. It's, it's just really easy to stay safe 
<laughs> it just is emotionally in life, right? It just is both, again, both from a macro point of view and micro between you and I right here, right now, I'd much rather stay safe. I would, I would just feel more comfortable. But if I can inch ourselves, if we can inch ourselves out into a little bit of discomfort, a little bit of listening and a little bit of empathy, you'll start to sort of see the world in a slightly different way. And, and there's an openness that, that kind of comes um, just slowly, albeit slowly, but it comes. This is great. This is great. I feel like I, I'm building a, a little tip sheet here. I have mindset, courage to be curious, empathy, tolerating discomfort. Mm. Robin, what can you share? Boy, I, I don't know what I could add to that. I mean, uh, both Michael and Brittany were so, you know, they, they really covered it. Um, I, I loved, um, I, I could picture when Brittany said, you know, people folding their arms and getting defensive when you say the word privilege. Because again, as I said earlier, you know, it, just because I was perceived as a heterosexual white man didn't mean I didn't have to study hard. I didn't have to work hard. I didn't have to do all those things that everybody does. So people do get defensive when you say privilege because they feel like you're attacking them so i think one of the ways that maybe you know we can help others is by sharing that yeah i have been the beneficiary of privilege and here's what it is and here's why maybe you didn't know that you were that beneficiary and then as michael said listening to what they have to say, but also sharing our stories. Because as, as I think somebody said on the earlier panel, if you were born in America, you have privilege. It's just some people have a lot more privilege than others. And, and so it's recognizing that we all have privileges, exploring that, and, and then trying to work together to make sure that we're understanding of, of each other and, and how we overcome our own thought process in terms of, of I've worked hard, this is mine, I should have this, and you know they don't deserve it. We have to overcome that. Yeah, thank you, thank you. And uh, I just direct people's attention to Brittany's comment in chat. Uh, equal opportunity does not always guarantee equal outcome, but it is the opportunity that isn't shared equitably. That's the point we need to examine when thinking about privilege. So I want to transition um, to something that is related to privilege, uh, related to the topic, uh, and that is unconscious bias. And so my question is, what is unconscious bias? And what was an early experience for you in which you realized your unconscious biases? Okay, so I'll I'll hop I'll hop in. Uh, unconscious bias is essentially our brain on autopilot, right? Michael talked about us trying to keep ourselves safe, and from the time that we get here, we are both we're verbally uh, and physically told different stories about our environment, right? And these stories are the stories that we continue to tell ourselves as we continue to grow in an effort to keep ourselves safe. So at any moment we're presented, for example, with about maybe about 11 million pieces of data, our brains can only process about 40 to 50 at any given time. So it's safe to say we miss a lot of things. And that's where unconscious bias comes in. That's where we make snap judgments about people, places, and things within our environment in an effort to respond accordingly. So I'll give an example. I'd, um, I'd gone to a, a deposition and I was sitting there, you know, with my laptop doing my work. And the other attorney comes in and he sees me sort of in the same way he sees the curtains, the desk, everything there. And he, he makes, goes over and makes himself coffee. And then he kind of wonders to the air. He never addresses me directly. He says, gee, you know, I wonder when the attorney's going to get here. And I immediately understand what's going on, right? Because the way that uh, the young black woman with the blonde hair certainly can't be the attorney, right? So I said, you know, I'm ready when you are. And his 
whole demeanor completely changes. Suddenly I go from being furniture to a human. And he goes, oh my gosh, I'm so, oh, okay, fantastic. Would you like a cup of coffee? How are you today? Okay, we're ready to get, get started, right? In that moment, what happened was he came in, surveilled his environment, his unconscious bias. He made a snap judgment about the person sitting in this room cannot be the person that I am looking for. Mm -hmm. And this happens in less than a second, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's when you have these moments, that's what uncon that's an example of what unconscious bias looks like. I'm sure uh, the other panelists have similar examples. That's great though, thank you. I, and I, I like that framing of it, uh, shorthand language, your brain on autopilot. Uh, so I, 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 that's a, it's a strong analogy for me to think about this topic. Um, you know, when, when we say the, the, the phrase contains it all, unconscious mm -hmm. bias, we're not mm -hmm. conscious of it. Yeah. It is, you know, as Brittany said, we're, we're on autopilot. We're not even thinking about that we do have a bias. And, and again, I'll relate it to my own personal experience. You know, until I transitioned, until I started working in this space, I didn't realize my own unconscious biases um, or biases. I'm not sure which is the right plural there. Um, and I think, again, because it's unconscious, we're not aware of it until you start to listen to other people and and attend things like this and be on panels with wonderful people like this and hear these stories and, and all of a sudden the light bulb goes off and go oh yeah I, I probably did something similar and oh yikes um that you know we we have to be educated because if something isn't is unconscious we have to bring it to our conscious self to be able to deal with it um, and, and I can give a, a similar example as Brittany did. Um, I was going to visit a client in, in jail and, and the client was a trans man, but held in the women's prison. Um, and so I went in, I checked in and the Lieutenant who was taking me back. And this is after I transitioned, um, the Lieutenant's taking me back said, have you met your client? And I said, of course. And she said to me, she's really strange. She thinks she's a man. And she was saying that to me, a transgender woman. She didn't know my backstory. And she just made an assumption in that moment that I was kind of a, you know, yeah, I had this bias the same way that she did, that, you know, trans people, there's something wrong with them. And, and so, you know, it, it's also, you know, that could segue into the next topic as well in terms of microaggressions. But I mean, that, that's an example of somebody using their own unconscious bias, or maybe in that case, conscious bias um, against trans people and not realizing who they were talking to. So, you know, we have to, again, examine ourselves to bring those unconscious things that we have to the fore so that we can deal with them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and we all we look at us, we all look at a situation and we create a story around that situation that has nothing to do with reality. Uh, and it's a natural part of how the human brain works. Uh, and, and so, you know, we, we all have to start with the understanding that each one of us is, is walking around with biases because the biases, another way of thinking about it is it's that lifetime of programming that we've had since infancy. Without question, and Mira, without really, exactly, really, go ahead, Michael. Point. Uh, I, I, when I reflecting on sort of how to define this, I thought this happens to all of us every single day, all day, all the time. And and one of the one of the advantages, I guess, I'm I'm sitting here reflecting and being grateful actually for being a clinician because one of the advantages that I have in terms of our clinical training is this is pounded into us from day one of school. Your client's going to come in, they're going to look a certain way, they're going to present a certain way, you're going to have your own reactions to it, which have nothing to do with the client. They have to do with the what you fill in, because we as human beings, we want understanding, right? We want to understand context. So we fill in lots of data, ching, 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 all around the, the person that you're with or the place that you're in. And um, I, I can think of a, just an experience I had fairly recently going to a, a family party. Um, and it was, it was a, a, 
maybe 40 people. Um, it was a nephew's graduation party and in comes a gentleman with lots of tattoos, right? They were sort of like fully, um, fully all over, hair a little long, didn't, didn't really fit that part of the family's usual look. Let's just say it that way with the tie and the, and the whatnot. And I, I sit down and I have all kinds of conclusions about what he's about and who he's about, at which time he starts to tell me what it's like to be in the MD PhD program at Vanderbilt. <laughs> and I think, whoa, it hit me literally like a ton of bricks to a point where I apologized to him. And we had this very interesting discussion because he's going to be going in, obviously into medicine, into research. And we had this very interesting discussion about how I had made these conclusions about who he was. And that when I say I made the conclusions, I, I, I don't know, five seconds, maybe, maybe it took me five seconds, maybe, maybe if I'm being generous, 10 <laughs> seconds, we make conclusions very quickly. It helps yeah. us feel safe, right? And part of that is mother nature. Part of that is helping us understand the woods so that when the lion is in one corner and the fire is in the other corner, you know, part of that is just that sort of just that, that part of the brain that keeps us safe. But it's the awareness. And that's the hard part of the unconscious, uh, unconscious awareness, unconscious biases. You have no idea that you're doing it. No, no clue until you're a little too far either into the conversation or into the process or um, something. And, and it, it really can be awkward. Awareness is the best we can do, right? So why am I feeling what I'm feeling? First of all, what am I feeling when I'm feeling? Secondly, why am I feeling what I'm feeling? What conclusions am I making? And we do it all the time, every day. The second we acknowledge and decide that we're doing it all the time, every day, the whole power differential shifts. And you think, okay, now I have a little better understanding um, of what's going on. But we do it all the time, um, every yeah. one of us. Yeah, absolutely. Um, none of us is immune from, mm. from this. And, and so, you know, creating that intentional space to uh, be more self-aware and, and kind of slow ourselves down from that you know, immediate story that we create is so important. Uh, Brittany, can, can I just add yeah, to, to, to Michael? I, I mean, think about this in, in the business context. The, his was a social setting. Mm. Think of it in terms of the person walking in for the job interview. Oh, yes. And, yes. and you make that snap oh, yes. judgment. Oh, yes. yes. Or I'll throw it over to Brittany by doing it this way. It, think of when you're picking that jury, if you go back to your past life, which you, you moved away from, <laughs> when you have, you know, you, you have in your mind this thought that this is going to be the perfect juror, but, but why are you thinking that? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's part of your unconscious bias. So it, it mm -hmm. plays into our, not only our social lives, but it plays into to our careers and how we form judgments about people and who we hire and who we promote and all of those things. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And, and you know, think about how many times you know someone interviews someone and will say, "I know in the first fifteen seconds whether or not this is the right person for the job." You know, how is that possible? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Um, but I do, to, to your point, Robin, I do want to bring it into the work context um, and picking up on Brittany's comment in the chat. She says that, you know, that's where the curiosity comes in. Can leaders mm. and organizations make space to question whether what they know to be true is actually true? And so my next question is, in what ways have you seen unconscious bias play out in a career setting? And, and you know, Robin, you just kind of listed a lot of the ways, you know, the recruiting process, promotional decisions, et cetera. But what are some of your, your personal experiences where you've seen unconscious bias play out in a work context? So Robin, I'll just, um, and, and thank you because it's exactly what I would do uh, picking juries. Right, and I was quite adept at it. Um, but so much of my success being undefeated, I attributed to being able to make those snap judgments about these people, putting them in this space and guessing essentially how they would interact together. And now uh, working with organizations and specifically working with senior leaders, using that same exact skill. So. I, I was working with an executive director who, um, you know, we were walking through some of that mindset and I said, help me understand. Michael said it earlier and it's one of my, my go-to phrases, right? And I said, help me understand 
why you chose this candidate over this one. The candidate that they chose uh, had less experience, um, you know, really didn't seem to have uh, the same credentials as the person they did not choose. And the executive director said, you know, I just know that the person we chose you know, they're going to go above and beyond. The person we didn't choose, they would never have gone above and beyond for us in the same way. And I said, you know, you're really lucky because I don't have access to a crystal ball, but you do. So clearly <laughs> you're able to figure out, you know, and project what this person would or would not have done. I wish I had that ability, you know, and that, that provided that you know, the world stop moment to say, oh, okay, was this really true? And as I started asking questions, we realized that the person selected reminded the executive director of the executive director's mother. It had nothing to do with ability, with competence, with skill. It was familiarity. And so when we talk about these things in the workplace and, you know, if we're being solution oriented, Leaders need to make sure that they first get the support in developing some of those mental checks, right? Uh, because had we not had that conversation, the executive director would have continued on thinking, this person is fantastic, would not have consciously made the connection that this person reminds me of mom, reminds me of home. So uh, that's, you know, that's something that I would recommend. Yeah, there's that, that wonderful affinity bias kicking in. <laughs> oh, without, without question, we do it that again, we do all the time and then that awareness. I'm going to flip it slightly. And as I'm sitting here reflecting and thinking about um, joining the organization that I am currently um, the leader of, and I was not the CEO when I joined the organization, I came in as a program uh, planner and a program developer um, and a clinician, of course. And um, we go through the interviewing process and everything is going well. And uh, they extend an offer and, and I start to check off all the cultural fits in terms of whether it's going to be a good fit for me. So now I'm, I'm thinking now from the employee side and I start to have a concern about will the LGBTQ, will my gayness fit within this organization? And I was stuck on how to assess that. I didn't know how to test that within within the culture. So the offer comes, we go to lunch and I say, and, and Robin, the employment uh, matters attorney is not going to like this, but I say, um, I, I'm excited about the position. I'm going to now have a discussion about fit, about whether I'm going to fit in an organization and I'm not going to sue you and I'm not going to, but I need to disclose at this point that I'm a gay person. Um, I have a, a husband, uh, then partner, this was pre-marriage by the way. Um, and although that isn't everything about me, if I am in the staff lounge on a Monday morning and you ask me what I did over the weekend. I am going to tell you that Jim and I went to whatever, or we did, you know, whatever. And um, it led to a very interesting discussion. It, it's concerning. It was anxiety provoking to me to try to figure out, because I knew, and I said this directly to the, to the then chief operating officer, I knew that if that was not a comfortable fit, I would not stay. And so I was trying to figure that out so that I wouldn't waste my time and waste their time. Um, and so there was the formal part of that. And they showed me the anti-discrimination policy, which, by the way, was well written and, and looked great. <laughs> but I needed to know what was sort of between the pages of the, mm. that's why you don't see the HR manuals on my, because the CEO, I think that's just paper <laughs> and just words. Mm. What's really going on? I, I view it as what's between the pages. What's What happens in the staff lounge? What happens um, in our process? And so... I try to remember that story as the CEO. I try to remember mm -hmm. that story that every person that comes to work at West Bergen Mental Healthcare has an experience. And then it's on us to figure out how to make them feel safe, how to make them feel included, how to make them feel respected. Um, and that's a challenge. And it's something that, I, so I always try to remember that story that, that it is, it was a scary moment. I'll be honest with you for, mm. for me, cause I was very comfortable in my last job. You know, you know how that goes. So it's like, all right, this looks really good, but that would be a deal breaker for me. That would ultimately it would not work out. I would not be happy and I would move on. And mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. and this think, is, I just, oh, oh, oh. no, no, go ahead. I just, I just wanted to add really quickly. Thank you, Robin. Um, this is why authenticity is it's a core value within, uh, certainly within my organization, because, um, you know, 
you can look at me, right? And, and we, don't, we don't have to make that disclosure, but I always have to be very clear that values, operationalizing mm. those values mm. is the approach. That is the way that I'm going to approach your organization and supporting you. Mm. If you say we value, you know, um, integrity or, or hard work, show me how. Right. Mm -hmm. And if there is that misalignment, I'm there to support you to get there. But we always have to be very clear. You know, I am uh, proudly I'm a black woman. I have varied experiences. Right. I I grew up in the suburbs. Right. That was a, a, a privilege that I was able to uh, to benefit from. But do understand that so much of my career was from the outside looking in, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I knew how to play golf, but I understood that only the young white men were invited every Thursday to go play golf, right? So um, taking those opportunities and being authentic to myself, seeing that as an opportunity to help other organizations. But Michael, I, I agree with you completely. Being authentic is going to be the thing that helps organizations connect more fully with, uh, with their current teams, their internal audiences, but they have to be willing to do the work. Yeah, yeah, and to, and to think about how do we create the kind of culture where everybody can come and feel like they belong and they can show up as their authentic selves. It's not about you know, f hiring people who, you know, I love the cultural fit you know, uh, <laughs> feedback on candidates. It's like, what does that actually mean? Help me understand mean? what you mean. Exactly. <laughs> what is the cultural fit? Right. Yes, yes. right. Oh, that's great. <laughs> Robin, you were going to say something? Well, I was just going to kind of build off uh, of, of, you know, flipping um, the, the picking a jury as Michael did in terms of becoming the employee and now being the lawyer and, and picking a jury. And what is the jury going to think of me? If you Google me, if you Google Robin Geigel, it will take you about three seconds to figure out that I am a transgender woman. Now, jurors aren't supposed to do that, but we all know they do. And so, again, I'm trying to figure out what their unconscious bias might be, not only against my client, but against me. And so, um, you know, like, like Michael, I, I am one of those people who is out and proud. And, and, and as I said, it takes about three seconds with a Google search to figure me out. Um, but I also realize that there could be a negative impact for my client based on other people's unconscious biases about me. Um, so, you know, that's something that, that I struggle with as an attorney. Um, and, and, you know, there are times when I will ask a judge to ask certain questions in a voir dire that are designed to see what someone's unconscious bias is or might be about me. Um, other times I feel comfortable, you know, not going to be a factor. We'll be okay. Not worried about it. But it's something that I think about every time, not just what are the jurors unconscious biases in terms of my client, but in terms of me. Yeah, thank you. Um, before we turn it over to uh, address questions from the participants in this session, uh, one other topic that's very related that I'd like to uh, spend a little bit of time on, and that's microaggressions, which, you know, we, we have probably all heard that term, but um, it would be helpful to start with a definition. What does microaggressions mean? What are we actually talking about? And then again, what examples of microaggressions have you experienced? And I, and I know just from some of what you've already shared that you all have probably lists of, of experiences in this regard. So I, I'm not sure I'm, I'm the right one to, to give the, <laughs> the definition. I mean, we, we all know it when we see it. Um, but, um, and, it's, and so I can give a, a perfect example, kind of building off my last, last answer. As I said, it takes about three seconds to figure me out if you Google me. And I was meeting an attorney who I had never met before. We, we, were, we had co-defendants in a case. And um, we met. 
And, and then he looks at me and he says, oh, you're, you're not what I pictured. You, 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 you look okay. And I knew what he was getting at. He was getting at the fact that I'm a trans woman and mm -hmm. that he had a certain stereotype in his head of what a trans woman should look like. And I didn't fit that stereotype. For those that, that can't see me, I'm all of five foot six. I mean, I'm not a big person. This is my hair. I mean, you know, uh, you know, it's. Um, I, I'm fortunate that I I have what's kind of known in another privilege in, in the trans community of passing privilege. I don't walk into a room and people don't say, hmm. um, but that was somebody who knew and 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 was trying to give me a compliment. Um, mm -hmm. They were trying to say something nice, and yet it comes out really as a microaggression. They're, they're like, there's something wrong here. You know, the way you said it, it is not right. So. I, I, would, uh, I would define microaggressions um, as low level and unintentional moves on the, on the relational chessboard where we are reminded that we are different or we are other or we are um, marginalized in some way. Not intentional. And, and I bet Robin, as, as silly as that lawyer sounded in the way that he or she said it, probably in, in truly in heart, probably unintentional in terms of, yes, of right. Of, of, Michael, and I love your definition because I think you're spot on. Yeah. And, and I can think about issues in, or, or times in my own life where this has happened. Um, uh, my, my husband and I, uh, enjoy traveling quite a bit and, and we were in a, a, a city, um, it, let's just say it wasn't in the northeast or the north. It was a different part of the country, and we were we were enjoying a long weekend there. And um, after about the third or fourth time, we we started to keep track of the number of times that when we had a meal together, we were asked whether we wanted separate checks. And so um, after the third time, I admittedly was a little fiery, not in touch always with my feelings of the way I should be. So I got a little fiery and I sort of politely said, no, we haven't had separate checks in 28 years. We haven't been you know, together. We haven't done separate checks. But by the end of that long weekend, and we, we arrived on a Thursday night and um, flew out on a Monday morning, I think the total number was eight, eight times that we were asked whether, whether we wanted separate checks. And so what that, and certainly the server in the restaurant didn't, and did not in any way, shape or form intentionally try to um, send us a message that we were not viewed as a couple or that we were not together or, or um, but it was very interesting. And it certainly, I think the issue with microaggression is that it's unintentional and usually low level, right? It's usually not a, a whole scene, right? It's not usually a, a whole big thing but there's an emotional cost to it, right? I know mm -hmm. how I felt. I know how I felt after the sixth, seventh or eighth time that that happened. Mm -hmm. And that's hard. And that, that over, if you take that, those low level aggressions, but you take it out over time, that's a lot of ching, ching, ching. Like, okay, wait, I'm feeling like I'm getting hit here a little bit. And there's a, there's a cumulativeness. It's not a word, but it should be. There's a cumulativeness to it that, that we, we have an emotional cost to that. Um, and it happens. Yeah. Regular. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's like getting yeah. stung by mosquito, and the mosquito <laughs> keeps going. At some point, you just like are so angry with that mosquito. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. That's a great, great analogy. Yes. <laughs> you know, I like I like to define microaggressions as tacit words and or actions that communicate our bias. And it doesn't always have to be verbal. It can be not making eye contact with people that we don't like, right? Or that we don't think are worthy of our time. Mm -hmm. um, it can be turning away, folding, leaning back, right? We have all of these ways to communicate how we feel about what and who we're presented with. Uh, so, you know, again, I've been told, oh, you know, you're so articulate. I've been told, oh, we're only trying the case because we want to look at Brittany. Uh, Yvette, to your, your comment, you know, I did feel that I could share. So that was a, a moment where I said, oh, you know, I noticed everybody, um, all the guys on the team go play golf on Thursdays, but you know, I've never been invited. No one else has ever been invited. None of the women, what happened? What's going on? And they said, yeah, well, you know, we just need time where we can, can get away from our wives. And I said, we're not married. 
<laughs> you know? And, so, <laughs> and I was like, wait a second, did I miss did I miss a life event? Um, that's that's what happens, right? Where we have these actions uh that you know, perhaps we don't intend for them to be conscious or uh, insidious, but intention and impact are not the same thing. I also want to highlight, we have micro affirmations as well, right? Same thing, tacit words and actions that communicate our bias. Biases are not always things that are, are negative, right? We have a bias toward people because of certain things. So, uh, you know, I'm full of scarlet pride, right? So anyone from Rutgers, I'm like, oh, they're brilliant people. Clearly they make great decisions, right? <laughs> but when we look at micro affirmations, that can be turning toward people, leaning in, right? Um, sometimes we're, we're more physical. We're willing to put our hand around them. We're willing to be helpful. We smile more. Those, uh, so that's really my, how I like to, to share microaggressions and also micro affirmations. Great, thank you. And I'd like to point out uh, Melinda's comment in chat. Another word for microaggression is identity-related aggressions. Mm. Mm. Yep. No. I, li I like yep. that. Very well said. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. So I think that we are ready to open the conversation up for questions from our participants in the session. If anyone wants to either uh, turn on your mic if you can and verbalize a question or if you want to type in a question. Ariel, I have something, it's Jackie. Hi. First of all, thank you to all the panelists. This has been, yeah, I, I, I hesitate to use the word fun but I do enjoy these discussions because although they get uncomfortable and although they, they, I don't know, they're edgy, I think that's what makes them so enjoyable because you take something away from every single word you all said. So thank you so much. So <laughs> I wrote down this question and it's edgy, <laughs> but I really, it's something that comes up a lot. What is our role and responsibility as far as forgiveness and teaching when it comes to when people exhibit unconscious biases and microaggressions? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna call on, well, go ahead. You guys fight it out. Who would like to take that? As Michael is just nodding. I'll go, I'll go. Jackie, because it's you, I'm going to go. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. <laughs> okay, it's great to see you. It is wonderful, wonderful to see you. Um, as a member of the um, LGBTQA plus community, I feel like I have a responsibility to come out. And so I realize that that's a, a, a little bit. And part of the reason I think I have a responsibility to do that is because we know what the data shows us. We know that the more out people of any part of our community that are close to you or around you, the more moderated your feelings will become if you have an extreme, let's say as an example, an extremely negative um, perspective. We know that the data shows us that the more of us, the more of us that are out, the more moderate um, feelings will become. So I feel like I have a responsibility to not just me, but I have a responsibility to the 13 year old that I'm gonna see in practice later that's struggling with depression because they're so closeted and so fearful and, and so afraid. And so that's sort of the macro answer, I think, that I think that I have a responsibility to do that. I think it's really hard, but ultimately the forgiveness part, there is power in that. There is there's energy that gets released when I'm able to forgive. And I don't think about forgiveness as a black and white, it's not like a light switch where it goes on and off. It's, can I get more comfortable with this person? Am I able to be more empathetic to what their experience was? Albeit they're in my mind, they're sort of negative, more closed-minded experience, which I have strong feelings about, right? Feelings come up for me about that. But if I'm able to raise my empathy on, on others that have that, we are able to dialogue and have uncomfortable conversations. And ultimately we lunge forward, 
even if we're lunging forward, sometimes can feel like turbulence at a train, right, in a plane when we're lunging forward, but sometimes can also feel like we're, we're making some progress, human being to human being. So outness and not quite forgiveness. I'm not quite sure what the word is. Again, not, not an on and off switch. It's a moderating of my own feelings about a particular person or situation. Mm, that's a real I, response, uh, I'm Michael. Sorry, yeah, Thank you. No, no, no. Right. I, I just wanted to say that um, forgiveness. I agree with you. Is uh, it's it's a very specific action, mm -hmm. but understanding that in the context of what they said to you, how they acted towards you understanding that this is an unconscious thing and we have a responsibility to teach mm. we do because they don't know and they will know once we teach them mm. or once we point it out michael excellent robin what do you think no i was just going to join right on with with what michael said um in terms of I do feel, uh, look, I was in a unique situation. I was in my 50s when I transitioned. I, I wasn't leaving my law firm. I couldn't, I couldn't be in the closet once I transitioned. I was out. I had to be. Um, so that was not an option for me. But I do think it's important to be, in, in, in my case, even more open and, and speak out about who I am because I do have a unique platform. Um, I am an attorney. Um, I, I am a professional. Uh, I have had all those privileges that we talked about earlier that I didn't lose the benefits of when I did transition. Mm -hmm. So like Michael talked about having the obligation to the 13 year old, I feel like I have an obligation to the trans community to put a human face on something that a lot of people don't understand. And in terms of forgiveness um it, it's a it's a, a thing that i have um i have always been willing to forgive people because it, it, again and I, I understand what michael was saying in terms of using that word forgiveness um but i do recognize that a lot of people don't understand transgender issues. And so their microaggressions or, or their unconscious bias or their conscious bias it is based on that lack of understanding. And if I react negatively, if, if I you know, attack them for their feelings, for their lack of understanding, I've prevented them from getting to the point where they might understand. So. You know, I don't want to say that I hold myself to a higher standard. I don't mean it that way, but I have to leave myself open to be willing to understand that people don't understand and help them to get to that point where they can. And, and I don't want to monopolize the time, but I'll just use my own mom as an example. My mom was in her 80s when I came out to her and, and she a, was a feisty Irish Catholic woman who went to mass every day every day. And so you can imagine that she struggled mightily with me coming out as a trans woman. And yet, after I transitioned, my mom, I'm not sure she ever really understood it, but she accepted it. And it was because, you know, we worked together and, and she saw that I was still the same person that she had always loved. And I'd like to think you know, we had a much closer relationship after I transitioned and we had a wonderful relationship beforehand. But, you know, if you remain open to people, if you give them that space to learn and to try to understand, and if they're willing to try to understand, everybody can get to a much better place. Oh, Robin, Absolutely. powerful words, powerful Gosh. words. Yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. thank you so much. Brittany, what do you think? So, Jackie, I'm going to push back a little bit on what you said, because I thought it was interesting. I, I've got to do it, right? There's got to be one. <laughs> of course, that's why we're here. <laughs> you said something that was fantastic about uh, it being our responsibility. And as a company culture consultant and a DEI practitioner, absolutely, I, I take that on. It is my responsibility. It's something that I love to do day in and day out. 
But if I am a uh, Latina consultant or an accountant, right? I'm, I'm not taking that on, right? And if I'm just in a group of people and I'm an accountant and I love to talk about accounting all day, it may not be uh, my responsibility to teach others within my community um, ab about that. But I will say that the way that I like to approach it, as you may tell from my responses, is with a, a little bit of curiosity and levity. So Yvette, for example, you know, said, how do I respond in an elegant way to a microaggression or, you know, so saying, oh, folks who deal with you would definitely know you're Latina. And the way that I might respond would be, yeah, well, you know, why do you say that? It's because... I'm so excellent or, you know, all of my clients keep coming back to me. Oh, you know, like, what is it about that? Help me understand, right? And that's where, uh, when approaching these questions, leaning in with curiosity, right? Because then it allows for that space for the intention to become clear. Are you being insidious? Are you, you know, with what intention are you making this statement? Is it ignorance? You just don't know. Um, you know, are you trying to communicate a bias? Are you trying to make me feel isolated? You know, what's happening there? More often than not, you know, when we have these moments, oh, what do you mean by that? You know, sometimes people get a little bit embarrassed and, but it clears the way to have a meaningful dialogue and uh, creates a space for understanding. By nature of who I am, I tend to assume positive intent, but I'm also curious, I'm always curious to know what happens next, right? So let's create the space for understanding so that I can understand your intention and perhaps you can understand the impact of what you said. And maybe we learned something from one another, but within doing that, that's really creating that. It's always for me about curiosity and uh, clarification. Mm, love that. Cautiously curious. And I'll say this, we have all become teachers, learners and teachers, right? And that's how we're going to get to the next spot. Miro, do you have anything to close out any, any more for your uh, session before we close out? No, I, you know, I, this has just been such a wonderful dialogue and, you know, I, I engage in, you know, versions of these themes all the time with, with our clients and, you know, every organization, every leader is, you know, trying to figure this out, you know, whether it's, you know, looking at their organizational culture or looking at themselves or looking at the interactions that are happening in the, in the work environment and, and, and where things are sometimes, you know, go awry. Um, it, everybody is trying to figure this out. And so I think your, your point is very well taken that, you know, we're all, we're all teaching and learning at the same time. And we're all very much on a journey. Uh, but I, I think that, you know, I have thoroughly enjoyed the, the, the panelists and your, your stories, your personal experiences and learnings uh, as you've been on your journeys. Um, so uh, thank you so much for your willingness to, to share, share those, those uh, perspectives and, and those experiences, because I realize also that sometimes it's, it's challenging to, to live through these experiences a second time, right? Like you've already lived through the pain of it one time and then you're re retelling it. Uh, so, you know, it, Definitely appreciate your willingness to do that. Thank so you let, let me just spin the word privilege and use it in a very positive way to say that it has been my absolute privilege with a capital P. Actually, let me bold it and all caps <laughs> privilege to be a part of this, this panel. I have learned so much. And Muriel, Robin, Michael, Brittany, thank you all for sharing your unbelievable experiences.